Hi friends, Oscar here at the Encore Vintage Academia. We're at the Booze Library. I'm a certified wine and spirits instructor for the International Wine and Spirits Guild. Thank you for joining me. And I did want to catch up on my promise uh, from the first and last episode that I, that I had, um, where I talked about comparing, contrasting to uh, two single malt whiskies. So before I get into the two whiskies themselves, um, a quick touch up on what it means to mean um, what it means to be a single malt when you're picking up something off the shelf, especially if you're not familiar with the category in general terms. Um, but most traditionally, Single malts um, come from Scotland and Ireland, and I think those are two big countries that have really taken the flagships of um, single malt to the luxury market because really most of their whiskies that get um, exported is actually blended whiskey um, because it is consumed all around the world um, but more of a specialty product uh, quality brands and uh, well-known producers and distilleries um, you always think of single malt and uh, really when you're getting uh, in the European context European Union context um, when you pick up a single malt uh, you're literally talking about a single distillery using 100% malted barley. So you you have your first raw ingredient, um, your raw material, which is malted barley and um, water and yeast. And those three classic base ingredients make whiskey in general, but the adjective of adding malted barley specifically as opposed to unmalted barley will make it a single malt as well, it has to be um, distilled in a pot still. So it's a pot still distilled whiskey, and you have a um, single distillery, a single grain, it being a malted barley base. Um, and then in the Scottish, Scottish and Irish, Irish tradition, typically it's a minimum requirement of three years of aging in wood cask or barrels. Um, and that pretty much covers what a single malt uh, typically means um, which is again uh, a minimum legal requirement um, in certain countries and every country even within the European Union can specify it more if they wish um, but that's the general European consensus um, as opposed to uh, an American single malt which is not yet a legal category in the United States um, however, there is an American single malt association and there's a band of producers trying to, well, they actually already uh, petitioned the government, um, submitted an application, and they're trying to pass um, an American single malt definition into code, um, which will generally follow the single distillery, malted barley, and pot still this still I don't know if there is going to be a, an aging requirement as of yet but stay tuned hopefully we'll hear back from uh, some of those producers in the near future or the government itself um, adding the category to the, the standards of identity of um, spirits um, typically single malts go into barrel at right about 60% uh, alcohol by volume and um, that will change depending on its um, aging environment and, and conditions. Uh, some of that will can evaporate and so um, the uh, spirit can become weaker or stronger really depending on where it's aging and how long. Uh, but it's typically a 60% when it goes into the barrel. And then generally speaking, um, most producers will actually dilute it further to um, at least a minimum standard if they so wished, which is usually 40% of alcohol that goes into the bottle. Um, 
but they could also possibly, if they wished, bottle it at cax, um, at the barrel strength or cask, cask strength or barrel proof, another way of saying whatever is in the barrel, they're just gonna bottle it at that proof without further dilution, which is neat to try. Um, other than that, um, lastly to touch base on what other countries may produce a single malt if you ho are hopefully buying in a bigger marketplace area and you have more options. Uh, there's really very cool producers um, with single malts coming out of France, um, Austria, um, Armenia, England also, um, Australia, um, some Scandinavian countries, some S Swedish single malts um, seen, or Iceland, uh, Finland maybe, uh, India of course, Taiwan, um, uh, Japan is another one that's kind of taken um, Scottish traditions in their distilling philosophy and methods. Um, and Canada, of course, I think Canada and the US uh, will also start competing a lot more in the single malt category. Let us know if you have any questions, if there's anything that you'd like to cover further, definitely leave us a comment uh, on the channel uh, post. Um, but let's not waste a lot of time and uh, get something on the palate to start sipping. Uh, so I actually, I'm gonna start with Swift. Um, this is made by Swift Distillery in Driftwood, Texas, and that's actually uh, just a few miles down the road from the um, Encore Vintage Academia headquarters here in Central Texas. Uh, this single malt is sitting at 44% alcohol by volume. Um, it was aged two and a half years total, and one and a half of those years was spent in um, ex bourbon barrels. And more specifically, producer gave us notes that it is four uh, four roses, Kentucky bourbon barrels. So one and a half year on that, and then they finished it in Sautern barrel uh, for another year. So two and a half years total. The finishing cask was a French sweet wine it's a sweet dessert wine coming from the bordeaux area known as sauterne and uh, very elegant wines that they're, they're produced uh, by fungal infection on the grapes that actually desiccates the grapes and kind of reduces the water content on the grape and it, it um, really leaves behind sugar and acid so it makes really luscious uh, delicious wines um, and actually they're very well known for a very honey-like character, a lot of stone fruits like peaches and apricots, and that really shows on this whiskey. Um, other than that, that's um, our, our main information on this whiskey, Swift Distillery, single malt from Texas, two and a half years of aging, and this was particularly distilled in uh, May. Uh, 2018 so this is uh, clear I will say this is on the bottle statement it says non chilled filter and you can see a very light um, haziness inside the bottle uh, which means there's nothing wrong with that but definitely expect a little bit of haziness um, however on the glass it seems clear and the main color is honey it's a pale honey with a straw transition and a very clear edge very watery edge my main uh, nasal impact is prickling there's a light warming a light drying sensation as well but mostly um, clean all right so it really shows as far as the aroma and bouquet it shows a lot of barley malt itself so the grain really shows through and besides the barley there's a lot of honey and apricot um, peaches it's floral so there's a little bit of elderflower 
there's almond, some baking spices, um, there is quince and yellow apple, as well as orange flesh. I, by that I mean it's not really quite orange zest and it's not really white orange juice, it's just like fresh uh, raw orange flesh. So it's got a little bit of everything going on, but I like that the barley shows through, then the f stone fruits, the orchard fruits, um, the floral and the spice uh, and almonds, a little bit of nuttiness. Um, the um, intensity of production is adequate and quite simple. The intensity of elevage or aging is also adequate but complex. It's got an average uh, um, average length um, and a very, um, I would say, a fine character uh, on its per persistence. Let's give it a taste. On the mouthfeel, the alcohol is sufficient. It's light, medium body, and the alcohol is smooth um, and coating as a mouthfeel effect. It's got a coating, smooth, sufficient alcohol for this light, medium body whiskey. Uh, the primary taste is sweet. There's a little bit of an accent of both sourness and bitterness. Um, but it's got a very buttery smoothness on the palate. As far as flavors, um, the barley shows through. I taste barley malt, I taste almond, orange, the spices, a little bit uh, in combination with ginger, ginger root. Uh, dried apple, the, the, the yellow apple from the nose kind of comes down to the palate as a dried apple and then there's a little bit of savoriness herbaceous savoriness almost like a red currant leaf or a black currant leaf or cassis um, herbaceousness the intensity of flavor is a medium intensity of flavor um, Slightly complex on the palate, and however, the balance is quite harmonious. Everything really works together well. It's got a straightforward, uh, long finish, and I would say my overall impression is very good. It's a very good whiskey. Uh, if anything, um, I do like that it partly shows on the palate and the nose. It really speaks to the quality, the craftsmanship of. Um, the distillery, the brewmaster and distiller working together and bringing the flavor of the raw product to the bottle and you, you, the fact that you can taste barley and it's not hiding. Um, but my only criticism would be that they could elevate um, the proof. They could leave this at a higher proof because um, it feels a little uh, thin, uh, thin on the palate. So I wish a little bit more body to match the complexity and match the uh, the nuance of the whiskey. But otherwise, it's a very nicely done whiskey. I would say um, my pairing ideas for this would be brie, brie cheese, or if um, you get at um, your hand at any soft rind, creamy cheeses, that would be an excellent pairing. As well as tomato soup or tomato basil soup, um, maybe include your grilled cheese uh, sandwich. Those are all um, extraordinary pairing, pairings I would recommend. Um, and if anything, throw out your own ideas, what you would pair with your whiskey or this whiskey. Um, and the main idea is not to really overpower the whiskey uh, to match the intensity of the foods that you're having with the intensity of the whiskey you're having. So let me know your thoughts. Cheers. And next up, I have the whiskey 
from Andalusia Whiskey Company um, out of Blanco, Texas. And that's also Central Texas. It's further than Swift from me, but um, it's really, really not that far. Maybe about an hour tops from here. Um, uh, so again, another Texas single malt. The main difference you're gonna see between the two is that Swift is following a Scottish tradition of, of distilling twice in a pot still. And the Andalusia company, um, they distilled three times in the pot still, which follows more of an Irish tradition. So a lot of the Irish whiskies are typically distilled three times, not twice like the Scottish. Uh, the main different um, difference that that can typically produce is twice distilled whiskies tend to be a little more masculine, a little bulkier, a little hulkier rather, and um, maybe a little more aggressive on their tones. Whereas when you distill three times, you usually make a little bit more of a feminine whiskey or elegant or um, fruity or more um, slightly slightly lighter style of whiskey. Um, so that is going to be the main difference between the two in general. Uh, the other difference is Swift did um, ex bourbon barrels and then finished in Sauterne cask and Andalusia Whiskey Company actually aged these two years um, on, um, on, um, on charred barrels. Um, almost making it like a straight style single malt. Um, this sits at 50% alcohol by volume. And I don't know that you can see this, but just comparing the two visually, even from far away, the Swift is quite light and this definitely has um, a little bit more color in it. Um, this is clear and a light canary in color with a canary transition and then a thin watery edge. The nasal impact is drying. It's got a drying uh, nasal impact. And then my aromas include um, hazelnut is one of the bigger things that show up hazelnut but then there's caramel there is coconut and vanilla there's spices uh, li um, a little bit of fruitiness that's a little tropical so it shows like guava or mango um, and also very ripe uh, orchard fruits or rather stone fruits like a peach and apricot marmalade and other than that uh, what also shows is like a burnt orange peel or a charred orange peel or a grilled orange peel. Um, so the intensity of production is adequate and simple on the nose and the intensity of aging or elevage on the nose is adequate and complex, pretty much following what Swift um, did. Um, it's average and ordinary. Uh, on the palate. It's a, it's a medium full body whiskey. And it's got um, a coating, slightly warming um, effect on the palate with smooth and sufficient alcohol. Um, the proper primary taste is sweet and there's an accent of sour and bitterness, just like Swift, um, and also a buttery smoothness on the palate. So again, light, medium body, I'm sorry, um, medium full body, sufficient smooth um, alcohol with a coating and warming effect, um, sweet with a little bit of sour and bitter and buttery mouthfeel. Um, on the palate,
I, I think all the nuttiness from the caramel, hazelnut, vanilla, coconut kind of shows more on the palate like chocolate. Uh, chocolate, leather, tobacco. And then there's a little bit of caramel and vanilla, but also um, the spices that show up on a buttered toast. Just freshly toasted bread with a dab of butter melting on top. Um, that is showing up on the palate quite well. The flavor is very concentrated, or rather, um, it's concentrated and complex, um, also harmonious on the balance. The main thing missing for me on this whiskey in contrast with Swift is the raw product. I don't quite taste or smell the malted barley. I think that grain kind of got a little lost um, through a lavage, but we'll, I'll try to touch back on that note in a minute. I really enjoy the nose and the flavors. I think they're there's a wonderful combination of of um, nuance and complexity and concentration but if anything the grain got a little lost um, nonetheless the aftertaste the finish is still uh, straightforward and very pleasant um, and very long um, I'm gonna call this as, a, as an excellent whiskey on the overall impression. Personally, I think I would pair this with a mushroom risotto or um, a grilled mushroom or a mushroom ravioli. Really anything mushroom would work really nice with, with it, it, its earthiness. Um, and also, uh, some fowl, maybe if you want to do a quail, a grilled quail, or some duck, um, or elk, bison, venison. I think venison or bison would work really nicely, especially if you get a chance to do a coffee rub on that um, game. Um, it would be an excellent addition to the char undertones on this whiskey and work really nice and work with you on the grill. Um, Nice job, I think I found a new favorite to keep on the shelf. I really like that Andalusia. Um, another thing I want to uh, touch on was what I mentioned about Elevash. And Elevash, it's, it's a production term we would use for wine or spirits when they're basically undergoing aging treatment or really any treatment you use after fermentation basically you finish your production of fermenting your raw material and pretty much anything after that is raising the spirit or wine it's uh, rearing the life of the wine or spirit so that is called elevage you elevate the spirit or wine into um, a new self in other words and so you always kind of when you're evaluating wine or spirits you want to distinguish what uh, you're smelling that is part of the production method um, that's basically from the growing conditions and harvest onto the production fermentation and then anything post fermentation um, the aging and celery treatment would be called elevage um, don't mind me I'm gonna take another little dram here And just before we close this episode, I want to go, since we have both, I guess, a combo of um, Texas whiskey, but both in a Scottish and Irish tradition. Um, and these are both whiskeys. We get the English word for whiskey from kind of like a Gaelic uh, sound for, for wishka, wishka. So if you go to the British Isles, where you find Gaelic people, both from the Scottish or Irish traditions, um, whiskey would be called wishka. But the word wishka itself gets its roots from ishkabaha. Ishkabaha. Say with me, ishkabaha. Now what ishkabaha means 
literally translated to English is the water of life. And where that comes from is the Latin of um, the, the water of life. So when the first distillers back in the old times started distilling a raw product, what came through the distillation process was typically a clear liquid that looks like, like water, and that's where you get your, your new make whiskeys, basically. Uh, but, but they would call that water of life because A, it looks like water, but B, it doesn't really go bad. So it's a, an everlasting water. Um, and the term of aquavita or water of life became known around the world in its own languages um, as the, dis dis the, the end product of, of a distillation run. And so in the, in the Gaelic tradition, that would be called ishkabaha. Eventually that got shortened and, and, and vulgarized in a way to, to say uh, vishka. And vishka, the Angles took it as whiskey, eventually it became whiskey. And on that same tradition, um, I cheers on to you, which the Gaelic would say, um, slancha, slancha. As lancha is uh, to your health, just like in French we would say santé, or in Italian salute, or in Spanish salud, the Gaelics would say slancha. Really like those whiskies. Uh, let me know in, your, in the comments what you want to learn about next, what you want to see me taking a drop off of the, the wall and we have whiskies from all over the world, including mezcal, tequila, sotol, uh, rums, rye whiskey is my favorite, which we may be in do, doing next. But anyway, welcome your feedback. Um, I know you're not stranger to social media, so click like, subscribe, find us on Instagram, Uncork Vintage ATX, or our Facebook page, uh, Uncork Vintage Academia. And I, also before I close, in case anybody out there is interested in a one-on-one -on -one spirits seminar, I've, I, I teach formal education on spirits uh, that includes organoleptic tastings. We taste about 25 spirits in 12 hours, including your lectures um, in a formal sem seminar. And I'm currently doing those one-on-one -on -one, um, in, in Central Texas. So if you're interested, get in touch with me, contact me. You get this um, proprietary material. Uh, we'll go through a tasting together. Um, includes also vodkas and brandies, uh, cognacs, armagnacs, European brandies. We'll go over Scottish, Irish whiskies, bourbon, rye whiskey, domestic American whiskies, uh, and the agave spirits that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I hope you can join me. Uh, but until next time, slancha friends.